In this video, I'm going to show you 53 Autodesk Fusion skills you need to know, starting from beginner all the way to advanced. But first, a quick shout out to our sponsor. This video was sponsored by Autodesk Fusion Masterclass 2025, an online video course that teaches you everything you need to know to design your own amazing things. It's the quickest way to go from beginner to advanced Autodesk Fusion user, complete with easy to follow unique course projects. Find exclusive discounts in the description below. Now back to the video. Tip number one, creating objects is as easy as drawing a sketch and extruding that sketch. You could even create sketches on objects and extrude those sketches. Tip number two, use curves to make your designs look more professional. These curves are called fillets and you could also add chamfers as well. Not only do these make your parts look better, but they can also make your parts stronger. Tip number three, use the view cube in the top right corner to quickly switch between standard views. Tip number four, don't use the whole tool, use sketches instead. You ironically have less control using the whole tool compared to just manually creating the sketch and extruding it. Tip number five, use S to access the shortcut menu. For example, I could type in sketch to find the sketch tool. For sketches in particular, there's an even quicker way. Tip number six, simply press T to create a sketch anywhere in your drawing. Just by knowing the keyboard shortcuts, you could speed up your design process by a lot. Tip seven, when you're in a sketch, you could press L to create a line. And if you click and hold while creating a line, you could automatically create arcs. This could take a little bit of practice to get used to. Tip number eight, to speed up your design process, press C for circles and R for rectangles in sketches. Tip nine, whenever possible, it's worth it to properly constrain your sketches. This way you could always go back in your design and change a dimension if you need to. Tip number 10, learn all the constraints for sketches. For example, this sketch has a couple of different constraints. We have simple dimension constraints here for the lines. We have a diameter constraint here. We have a midpoint constraint for the circle. And for all of the lines here, we have horizontal vertical constraints, as well as another midpoint constraint for this construction line. Tip number 11, you can manually move or rotate a face by right clicking on it, click move copy, and use these handles to move or rotate that face. Tip 12, you can look directly at a face by using the look at tool. Simply select the face you want to look at and then click on the look at button. Tip number 13, when creating a sketch and dimensioning your shape, let's say a rectangle, you can press tab to cycle through input fields. This works in dialog boxes or when you're setting dimensions of sketches. Tip 14, let's say you want to see the dimension of something in your drawing. Well, all you have to do is select that item and go down to the bottom right and you can see the details of that item. So we can see this curve radius is a radius of 20. And if we click on this circle here, it has a diameter of 12 millimeters. And we can even see the thickness by selecting two faces and measuring the distance between the two faces. So in this case, it's a minimum distance of 6.9 millimeters. We could see the distance between two points. So just click on one point and then the other point and you can see the distance in this case 21 millimeters. And finally you can see the distance between curves as long as they're perfectly parallel. In this case these two curves are 15 millimeters apart. Tip 15. If you want to move or adjust a curve you could use the press pull feature. Simply right click on the curved surface and go to press pull. Tip number 16. You could use the layout grid and grid snapping to easily block out simple shapes. This way you don't have to manually type in the dimensions. Tip 17, press F on the keyboard to access the fillet command quickly. Using keyboard shortcuts will greatly increase the speed of how fast you can design something. Tip number 18, you could use the timeline to go back to any command and make modifications. For example, let's say you want to go back and change the radius of your fillet. Well, simply double click on that part of the timeline and change the radius dimension. The timeline can be very powerful in Autodesk Fusion and I highly recommend getting used to using it. Tip 19, instead of manually toggling the visibility for objects, you could simply select any part of the object and press V on the keyboard. And you could right click the object's parents or folder and select unhide all to make all objects visible. Tip number 20, use the keyboard shortcut X to toggle between regular lines and construction lines in sketches. 
construction lines are essentially guidelines or reference lines. Tip 21. Use the keyboard shortcut E to extrude. Tip 22. Organize components or bodies in groups. Simply create a new group and drag the bodies into that group. Tip number 23. Use the canvas tool to import reference images into your design. You can scale the image as well as set the opacity. Now let's go ahead and move on to the intermediate and advanced fusion tips. Tip 24. Use the loft tool to make smooth, complex transitions between different profiles. For example, here I could connect a square and a circle face. Tip number 25. Use a mid-plane construction plane to cut objects in half. You'll basically use two faces and it'll center the plane between those two faces, go to split body, and use the construction plane as the splitting tool. And now we have the object cut perfectly in half. Tip 26. You could create construction planes on edges or paths. For example, by creating a construction plane along this curved path here, I could draw out a triangle profile and revolve it around this cylinder to create a notch out of the peg. Tip 27. Learn how to use the emboss tool to create text and graphics on curved surfaces. Tip 28. Use the shell command to hollow out solid bodies. Tip number 29. Know the difference between components and bodies in Autodesk Fusion. Components are independent movable parts with their own origin, timeline, and assembly relationships. While bodies, on the other hand, are solid geometry within a component that cannot move independently. Basically, use components for assemblies and moving parts, and bodies for single solid designs. Tip 30. When you're creating basic moving assemblies, one of the components has to be pinned in order for it to work. For example, if I unpin the axle, you'll notice when I move the gear, the axle moves with it. That's because the axle is unpinned. I'm showing you this because this is one of the things that I got stuck on and I had to look up how to fix it. So now you know what to do ahead of time. Tip 31, capturing a component's position. In this design, we have no components, just a body. And if I try to click and drag and move the body around, you'll notice nothing happens. But if we go over to this design where we have components, we could click and drag and move the components in our scene, especially since I have this one connected with a joint. After you click and drag and move a component, you could go up here to the capture position button. This basically tells the program when you want the position of an object to actually be set compared to when you're just moving it around and testing your assembly. Tip 32. This is a fun one, how to easily create a spur gear. All you have to do is go to utilities, go to add-ins, now scroll down to spur gear, click run, choose the settings, click OK, and now we have a perfect spur gear. Tip 33. But what if you want to create more advanced gears like helical gears, for example, or worm gears? Well, you go to the Autodesk App Store and hit the GF Gear Generator, and this one is actually free. Tip 34. There are a few different types of joints in Autodesk Fusion. There are rigid, revolute, slider, cylindrical, pin slot, planer, and ball. For a gear and an axle, I would pick revolute. This basically will make the gear spin around the axle. Another option for this setup could be revolute and slider. This will allow the gear to slide up and down the axle. Tip number 35. There are two different ways to create joints between two components. You could use a regular joint command. A much easier way to build joints is to use the as built joint command. This will build the joint at the current position of the two objects. Tip 36. You could change the appearance of objects in your scene by right clicking on them, go to appearance, and here we can set both the material and the color. So for example, we could go ahead and drag ABS white onto this gear, double click on this right here, and you could change the color to whatever you want. That's how you could easily change the color of objects in Fusion. Tip 37. Once you set the color and material of the objects in your scene, we can make some fairly realistic looking renders. You can do this by clicking this button here, go to render, and here we'll have a rendered scene. To show the actual render in your canvas, click this button here, to allow in canvas render. Now, depending on your computer, this could take a while to load, but you can already tell how we have this kind of realistic looking ABS plastic gear. On the bottom right here, you can see the progress. Now, after a while, you can see it's looking pretty good. Tip 38, you can easily create threads in Autodesk Fusion. All you have to do is select on the face of a cylinder, go to create, go down to thread, and make sure to click on modeled. Click okay 
And now we have 3D printable threads. Tip 39. The best way to successfully print threads for 3D printing is to set the layer height extremely small, even down to 0.08 if possible. Another trick you could do is stretch the body vertically. Click the body, go to modify, go to scale, select non-uniform, and set the Z scale to 1.5 or 2. Now the overhang angle isn't as steep and you should have more success printing it. Tip 40. Let's say we have this spinning washer on this threaded part, but we want to make sure we have enough clearance so it could freely spin. Go to inspect, go down to section analysis, click on a plane, and now we can see inside of our object to make sure there's enough clearance. You can also move the section plane like so. Tip number 41. The easiest way to add extra clearance between a threaded part is to simply use the shell command. Basically, take the threaded part, copy it, add an outside shell of about 0.2 millimeters, subtract that from your threaded part, and now you should have perfect clearance. Tip number 42. A really powerful feature of Autodesk Fusion is the ability to create custom parameters. Go to Modify. Go to change parameters. If you click on this plus button right here, you can create your own custom parameter. Let's call this one length. And let's set the value to 42. Now let's create another user parameter. And this time let's call it width. And this time let's set it to 70. Now we have two custom parameters that we could use and change in the future. For example, if we're creating a sketch, let's create a rectangle. We could set this dimension here to the length and you can see it automatically populates. And we could also set the other dimension to the width. And I'll select right there. So now you can tell it's using the custom parameters. Now let's extrude this sketch. Now let's say we're further along in the design and we want to change one of the parameters. Well, all you have to do is go to modify, change parameters, or use the keyboard shortcut uh, shift command P, and then go ahead and double click on the expression and we could change it to whatever we want. Let's say 21. And our shape has automatically been updated. Tip four. 43. You could also use custom functions in your parameters. For example, let's go back to change parameters here and let's change the expression from just a set value to a function. So we could do width divided by two. Now it'll automatically make the length the same as the width divided by two. So in this case, it should be 35. Or if we change this to 80, it should be 40. If we click OK, now we could see our length is 40 and the width is 80. Tip number 44. Let's say you have a design with a lot of different parts. An easy way to single out a part is to right click on the body and go to find in window. And it'll automatically zoom into that object. Tip 45. When designing for 3D printing, you have to consider a few different things. And one of them is the overhang angle. Let's say we have this part right here and it has to be printed in this orientation. Basically, this is the bottom of the part and it has to be for whatever reason for this specific design. Well, if we have a wall here and it's at an overhang like so, the overhang angle could only be so steep. And in this case, let's say it's 60 degrees. That's about as steep of an overhang as you would probably want for 3D printing. And at this steep, the surface quality might not be the greatest. I recommend staying around 50 to 45 degrees for higher quality printing. Also, very steep overhangs will increase the print time depending on your slicer. Some slicers print very slow on steep overhangs, like 60 degrees. Tip number 46. There is a special type of overhang overhang that a 3D printer can handle without too much difficulty most of the time. This is called bridging. It's when the surface right here, this surface, is perfectly parallel with the build plate. In this case, the 3D printer can actually bridge across over midair without any supports. Tip number 47. How much clearance do you need to add between two different parts in a 3D printed design? A good rule of thumb for extra clearance is anywhere between 0.2 millimeters and 0.8 millimeters. 0.2 can be perfect if your 3D printer is accurate enough and anything less than 0.2 most likely is not enough extra space between parts and they will fuse together. For loose fitting parts, 0.4 is usually pretty good and anything over than that will be fairly loose. Tip number 48. In the world of 3D printing, there's a thing called a print in place mechanism. These are assembled components that print as they are without any need of supports. And most of the time these are moving parts like hinges or wheels or other things like that. 
This part right here has print in place wheels as well as a print in place hinge. Tip 49. You could use the sweep tool to sweep a profile along a path. However, if we have a 3D path sketch like this one here, and we try to sweep our profile along it, check out what happens. Let's go to sweep, and we will go to the default single path sweep, select the path right here, the loop path. You'll notice the track twists in a way that we don't want. So let's go ahead and fix this by using a sweep with a guide rail. What you could do is we could take this spline right here, let's go ahead and select on this, we'll do copy paste, and we'll move it over a little bit like so. Click finish sketch, and now let's go ahead and take our sweep right here, take our profile and sweep it, go to create and sweep, and this time we'll use a guide rail. So let's select on our main path right here, and to keep it from twisting, we'll select the guide rail, which is parallel to the path. And now we have a perfect sweep along the path. And it doesn't have any sort of weird twisting that we don't want. Tip 50. In Autodesk Fusion, you could create motion links between joints. So right now, this assembly has no motion links. So if I try to spin this gear, you'll see nothing happens to the other gear. Let me just put that back there. So all you have to do is go to assemble, go to motion link right here. And now uh, we'll need to capture the position first and then we'll select the two joints. So we have this one here and this one here. And right now the ratio is a one to one in our settings here, but we want to change that to make it more accurate to the actual setup here. This one here will be in negative 180. And now you can see they're meshing properly and have a two to one gear ratio. Go ahead and click OK. And now if you go to move your gear, you'll notice the other one moves properly. Tip number 51. In Autodesk Fusion, you can create your own scripts and add-ins. And this is much easier now with the help of AI, but it's still fairly difficult. Here's some custom scripts that I have right here. This one exports all bodies as an STL. And this one right here I just created right now exports selected bodies to STL files. And I've been wanting this type of functionality for a while. That way I don't have to manually export a bunch of different bodies. I could just select which bodies I want to export and it will export those STL files. Now, how did I do this? Well, I used AI. First, I tried using Claude 3.7 Sonnet because usually it's the best for programming tasks. However, it kind of struggled with this add-in. So then I switched over to ChatGPT4. I basically just said, create a Fusion 360 add-on script that saves all selected bodies as an STL mesh. Have it prompt for the destination directory. I'm selecting the bodies from the object browser tree, blah, 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 blah. You could be really informal with how you talk to the AI. And basically I was not able to one shot it. I had to give the AI what went wrong a couple of times and eventually I got it to output a successfully working script. So here's how it works. Let's say I want to export bodies one and two. I select those two bodies, go to my custom add-in here, export selected bodies to STL, click run and it'll prompt me for where I want to save it. I'll call it example. Click open, export, completed successfully, okay. So now if I check that folder, you'll see I have body one and two saved. Tip 52, you can utilize the massive McMaster card catalog of different hardware components, save them as a SOLIDWORKS file and open them directly in Fusion 360. And finally, tip number 53, it's much faster to export an STL file simply by right clicking on the body, go to save as mesh, select STL for the format, set the refinement to high, and click OK. Let me know in the comments which tip you found the most helpful or which one you're most surprised by. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Fusion 360 Masterclass 2025. My name is Steven from 3D Printer Academy. I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching and happy printing.